In this episode of the Thermal Review, we discuss the latest megatrends impacting the development of microelectronics and how thermal imaging can aid in the development, manufacture, and performance of microelectronics. Good day, Marcus. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Hi, how happening? are you? Oh, my gosh. Everything's happening, right? Yeah, all at once. All at once. This just seems to be a very uh, crazy time it, 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 for many different aspects. And we won't get into those, right, <laughs> in today's uh, episode of the Thermal Review. Today, uh, as per our intro, we're going to talk mainly about electronics, microelectronics. And this application, as, as talked about in the intro of utilizing thermography for electrical inspection, that, it's been around forever. It, it, it was like the primary application for industrial thermography, right? Yeah, definitely. From the, from the passive thermography side, for sure. And even yeah. from the um, maintenance sort of, uh, you know, electrical maintenance, looking at you know, circuit breaker panels or any, any sort of control panels to, to kind of get a quick idea about loose connections and, and, and those kind of things, right? Yeah. Early in my uh, infrared career, Marcus, I spent many times in electrical substations uh, or power generation plants. I've even been in helicopters looking at uh, transmission lines with infrared thermography. Uh, because it's such a perfect fit. Anytime you have right. that resistance or something constraining that flow of that electricity, you have heat. It's just a buildup of heat, and you can identify and see those things so readily and quickly with the infrared camera, which that's why it's such a perfect tool for electrical inspection, because you can see it right away as a hotspot. And then of course, with these calibrated cameras that measure temperature, then you can start to, you know, quantify things and, and make, especially yeah. if you have like, you know, multiple phases, you can do phase comparisons of, um, you know, from one phase to another to see if you have any kind of increase in resistance or a potential problem. And oh my goodness, uh, in California, with regards to uh, the need for power, how critical oh, yeah. it is that things are up and running right yeah the the yeah the uh where do i start there the the electrical <laughs> grid obviously is uh in pretty poor shape here in yeah. california i mean doing the most recent heat wave we had the the governor basically coming down saying you can't even charge your electrical vehicle during certain peak hours of the day because they wanted to avoid you know rolling brownouts and those kind of things and and another thing is um, what happens a lot of times is, um, uh, you know, brush overgrowth, like touching electrical overhead mm -hmm. lines and causing wildfires. I mean, we have we seem to be bouncing between wildfires, earthquakes and mudslides here, depending on the time of the year. It's <laughs> paradise, then, uh, though. Some... <laughs> it is beautiful, for sure. <laughs> you know, and then it's. Uh... Yeah, I mean. But uh, yeah, thermography is definitely useful. We we have done some projects actually doing surveys on on electrical lines. Um, you know, mm. just driving driving around with cameras and and looking at the overhead lines. And man, you find something uh, on on every corner. You know, there's some sort of a splice that's getting too warm because probably of a of a bad connection. You see transformers heating up to to kind of a critical level to all kinds of things. So. Having that technology in place would definitely uh, provide you with the tools to do kind of like a predictive sort of a scenario mm -hmm. and, and maybe, you know, avoid or help avoid any sort of like catastrophic sort of a breakdown. Yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. Definitely, definitely a useful tool. So we're we're gonna still distill down, if you will, kind of the, that large power grid <laughs> into the electronic space, right? So we're and um, you know that we're we're seeing some some very specific mega trends out, out in the marketplace today um, that is is really impacting this microelectronics space. 
And we, we kind of touched on one just uh, here a little bit. We're talking about power and energy. And that happens to be one space that seems to be, you know, evolving and changing uh, continually because of, you know, well, out of necessity, because of what you've been describing of what's been, you know, going on there in California with uh, some of the, the brownouts and things. We've heard about the, the energy situation in Europe as a result of things that are happening with Russia and Ukraine. Um, mm-hmm. There's this push towards green energies and solar and wind. Um, and that, that, that happens to be one of those big mega trends right now that, yeah, a lot of these things we're talking about are very large in size and scale and things, but it also has an impact on the microelectronics space. Another area, I mean, you touched on this as well with regards to that battery powered car that you can't charge right now. But smart mobility is one area that we see as well that is uh, a lot of emphasis on, right? A lot of focus on. And I know we're even involved uh, as a company at Movitherm with things that are happening in that space, not only with uh, electric vehicles, but also with regards to like the next generation uh, mobility from a aircraft perspective, like, you know, drones right. for humans, right? Yeah, drones, flying cars, um, personal aircrafts, all of the above. And then the, the holy grail again is, you know, energy storage, of course, and um, these these are now being built, um, you know, with electrical motors in them, and and not uh, any sort of combustion engine anymore. And um, yeah, I mean, it's like uh, you know the, the the weight versus energy density is is a big topic for everybody. And uh, oh my god, the, the more you pack the the power in, the more uh, kind of a risk is there for you know th- thermal uh, runaway and and issues because stuff is getting smaller and smaller and the materials are getting thinner and thinner so Mm. you know you're walking a fine line between you know getting the most out of your battery pack versus also creating a certain amount of risk um for for the battery pack to have thermal issues obviously that's a big challenge you know also from a perspective of um you know how fast can i charge the battery pack versus uh discharging it and and you know the more current you run through it you better make sure that your you know, your your welded connections are are good and and a very low resistance because if you have you know a, a poor weld connection then like you said if you if you're running three four five hundred amps through a connection and you have a slightly higher resistance that's going to create a significant amount of heat you know yeah and wow interesting and great point that you bring up because like in battery storage or power technologies and we talked about this in our last podcast with our, our guest, Jerry Beanie from, from Teledyne FLIR. You touched on this thermal runaway, which, oh my gosh, yeah, that's, that's a whole nother, you know, potential issue uh, that's caused by this increase in resistance, this generation of heat, and then that cycle that occurs in, you know, lithium ion batteries to run away. And next thing you know, you have combustion. Um, another another uh, mega trend that we're seeing, and we talk about this a lot, and that has to do with IoT. You know, just the connection of everything. Well, mm-hmm. that requires electronics, right? Uh, to to bring yeah. all these you know different devices together, talking to each other, being connected. So, you know, we're really seeing you know wow some 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 big developments. Uh, uh, some significant changes in, in these areas of just, you know, mobility and transportation. And then again, with power and energy, and then with IO, IoT and, and networks. I mean, these are big global trends that we're seeing having a huge uh, and significant impact on, on the development of electronics. And yeah, anyways, definitely with that. Yeah. Sorry, no, go right. ahead. Thanks. <laughs> now, this just sparked uh, an idea there or a thought, um, especially like the, the power electronics, right? Um, because the, the electronics that actually use the battery power now to, to drive these motors, whether that's an electrical vehicle or, or flying cars or w- whatever the case may be, it's, it's all, or even, you know, handheld devices. It's all um, about power electronics now that can convert that power and, and, and do something with it. And, um, you know, these devices are super high frequency switching sort of devices at a very high power mm. level and, and it's getting more and more miniaturized. So 
that that's definitely also a prime target for thermal analysis because again if if whatever is being designed is not working properly heat is a number one killer of electronics right so it's really you know that's kind of thing another another trend is also you know led illumination taking over for for any other you know incandescent lighting and fluorescent lighting and, and again you know the, the the power electronics for those kind of things i mean how many times have you seen you know traffic lights where where it's starting to flicker that this led array you know it, it it started the 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 death of heat essentially because especially here in california you know the 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 traffic lights are black coated and they're they're at 110 degrees heat or something so the stuff heats up to 150 degrees plus and you have power electronics in there that that have to get rid of their dissipation of heat and so you see these um, you know they they were all in my opinion there's a design flaw in most of them you know in 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 the, in the first generation designs they they kept failing left and right nowadays it looks a little bit better but i've i've noticed you know they they failing all over the place where there's clusters of leds kind of like flickering or have completely turned off and in traffic lights you know wow yeah and it's I mean, heat is is such a uh an enemy if you will <laughs> in the electronic space and 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 just in my uh experience uh when i was out you know doing demonstrations with with infrared camera systems uh in the r and d uh research and development uh engineering stages with uh, uh different developers of of technology it seemed like that battle with heat is a constant one and, and right. one of the things that I would hear all the time is that, well, things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller from an electronics perspective, which is making the challenge of removing the heat even even more of a challenge, a greater challenge, if you will, because we, I mean, we just keep, you know, miniaturizing things. They keep getting smaller yeah. and smaller and smaller, and that heat is becoming more and more of an issue because it compromises the performance of those electronics. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, we have this also with you know even our thermal cameras are getting more and more powerful. They uh, dissipating mm. a lot of heat, and then you have to sometimes put them in a protective enclosure from the environment, and then how do you get rid of that heat now, right? So that that has been a big challenge as these cameras become more powerful. You also need to dissipate more heat, and and yeah, it is, <laughs> and, and that that problem has has not been solved really. I mean, solved to, uh, you know, an applicable, practical way. But um, you know, th that is that is one of the biggest limitations is really you know miniaturization of things, and and the heat dissipation is still there. You know. Yeah. So let let's let's talk a little bit about how this. I mean, how how thermography. How infrared camera technology uh, uh, can be utilized um, uh, in the area of, of microelectronics uh, development. Um, I, I know that uh, <clears throat> you know there's there's modeling uh, softwares that are used by engineers you know throughout the world for. Um, uh, developing models of how a particular uh, device may operate in a certain environment under certain conditions. How, how, Marcus? How could someone utilize thermography in conjunction with, you know, thermal modeling and analysis type software? Yeah, good question. I mean, I I have actually done this. My my background is actually electronic engineering and computer science. For for the viewers that don't know my background so much, but. So I have I have done many of those electronic design challenges and um, had to deal with heat dissipation, designing uh, you know thermal management, heat flow, you know, whether it's forced cooling with a cooling fan, with a thermo thermoelectric cooler like a TC cooler, um, or you know you know water cooling or whatever the case may be, depending on on the sort of power loads that you have to get rid of. So you can you can um, there's there's some fantastic packages out there. For instance, we're using um, Fusion 360. It's a 3D CAD modeling software uh, for mechanical design primarily, but they also have other plugins for um, you know 
um, thermal management and, and thermal analysis. So you, you can you can actually say, okay, here's my my chip or my power electronics, and it's it's dissipating 90 watts or something like this on this little area. And then you can put um, you know that aluminum heat sink on top of it, and then you can actually see how the heat um, distributes, and you can actually measure in in your simulated model. You can measure what the temperatures are, making sure that you're you're you're, you're not reaching critical uh, temperatures for the operating conditions of that chip and all those kind of things. But in the end, um, putting this into practical applications, um, you know, the theory is always great, but um, where where the thermography helps you uh, come in with this is actually verifying uh, in your practical design under real world conditions um, is this really close to the simulation that you have because there are variables right so you have certain what we call interfaces so you have a a let's say a power um, um, a power transistor or something like a MOSFET transistor so you have the actual um, semiconductor chip or die you know inside okay and that thing is bonded on on a piece of metal and on top it's maybe capped with some sort of a plastic um you know and so from that from that um semiconductor chip the interface to that it's glued or bonded onto to to the metal that is a thermal resistance that it has to overcome because the heat has to transfer now from from that chip into the piece of metal and from that metal now into the heat sink and you know these um, semiconductors are not a perfectly machined and polished surface, so there there's some roughness on it. And you're attaching it to a piece of metal. And for those folks that are listening in, that are actually let's say building their own PCs, they know that they use some uh, thermal paste, right? So it's it's a little yeah. tube that contains some typically white or silver sort of paste that you put in between. And the reason for that paste is to decrease the thermal um, resistance between those surfaces to, to basically smoothen out those roughnesses in between the heatsink surface and the semiconductor, right? If you And it's so powerful. If you forget to put this on, you're literally, uh, in, in a matter of seconds or minutes, you're going to blow up that, that CPU that you just paid dearly for or whatever the case may be. <laughs> um, it is that important and it is that effective. So um, that's stuff that's a bit hard to simulate in, in your model because you applying this sort of stuff by hand and then you assembling it. And so there's variables in there that you're introducing in, in the real world application. And you have variables from, let's say if there's operators, um, you know, if you have 10 operators assembling the same thing, everybody does it a little bit mm. different. So that's, that's where thermography is very powerful because you actually getting a picture of the actual situation of what you, your complex design is actually producing in heat. And then you can actually measure real-world data and, and observe, you know, where the heat flows and, and you know how it's being distributed and all those kind of things. So that that becomes the final test, if you will, um, to give you the confidence that your design can withstand, you know, the abuse um, you know, of, let's say, a rough industrial environment. So that nothing nothing beats testing in the end. Um, you know, simulation is great. Um, it's fantastic. It, it saves you a lot of time. Because you can literally eliminate, um, you know, a lot of um, design errors up front to make sure that you're not having a design that is destined to fail. But at least, um, you know, you can you can get it. Uh, I always joke, you can get it that extra month beyond the warranty period, right? <laughs> <'Cause>, um, <laughs> have we not all had that happen to us, right? It's, oh, it's yeah. that one year warranty, and and on on the week after it's failing. <laughs> I wonder sometimes if that's by design. <laughs> How dare you say that, Marcus? I I, <laughs> I won't mention the brand, but yeah, I, I recently experienced that actually with a, a, a laptop for my, my daughter, a college student, that it was like a month out of warranty failed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, should have bought the extended warranty. Oh, well. Um, yeah, this, this, this idea of being able to use thermography to validate modeling. Awesome. Uh, how, how great. So it, it seems to me, I mean, we, we say many times that uh, uh, thermography helps eliminate the guesswork. And I guess that's, that's an, that's an example of that right there. You could, the, the, right. the, the modeling pretty, pretty good, pretty good. But I, I, I imagine there's always that question, but is it reality? 
And of course, then you can back that up with a thermal imaging uh, camera, imagery uh, uh, and analysis uh, to, to validate. Yeah, that's that's exactly what's happening in my model. What 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 are some of the different diagnostic um, uh, capabilities of thermography? So we just talked about modeling and validating that. But it, I mean, can can you utilize uh, the technology for diagnostics? Yeah, absolutely. So what we talked about right now, up until now, um, is really the okay helping the design process of a new design and supporting that sort of an effort. And then um, what happens when, you know, when something actually does fail, let's say you have, uh, you know, a few hundred, a few thousand devices in the field, then you're getting a certain percentage of returns of failed devices. So that's usually what it ends up in, in in your failure analysis lab, right? So you have a bunch of engineers sitting there with a bunch of nice tools and toys, I call them. And, um, you know, it's like, okay, throw everything you can at it and find out why why this is failing, right? Because it, it went through our um, modeling, it went through our design process, it went through the verification, everything was fine. But then in the longer you know, time period, things start failing, you know? And that's, I mean... There's folks that do obviously accelerated testing. They they do stress testing. They 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 you know ratchet up the uh, the pressure so to speak on on the device by just driving it beyond you know let's say 10 15 percent beyond its specified range and and trying to stress it and trying to break something. But um, it's hard sometimes to really simulate the real world you know quote unquote mm. abuse of of the electronics out there. It's hard to anticipate what they're really going through. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, semiconductors fail over a longer period of time. And that's just that's just the case. They, they just get, you know, and it, it could have all kinds of different um, reasons why that is. It could be, you know, for instance, um, a static discharge that went into a MOSFET circuit. It is causing some damage, you know, but you, you, it's running through its paces. It, it, you're running it through the testing. It's all it all seems fine. But what it did, it, it actually weakened the structure of the of the MOSFET chip a little bit. So then over a period of time of being stressed to its typical 90 to maybe 100% of its capabilities, the issue now is like that was based on the original specification of that chip. But now that high voltage discharge did some damage on the structure and actually, you know, weakened um, the characteristics of that chip, right? So now it fails, and and maybe it happened to a whole batch of chips or something, and now you have failures in there. Mm -hmm. um, now you want to know like you know what failed and how did it fail, and so you, now you can perform in your failure analysis lab, you can perform some troubleshooting um, again with thermography. You can look for um, you know shortcuts or something you know in in your in your system, um, and and the nice thing is I mean if if you if you do it the traditional way and you, you, you pull out your multimeter or your scope or something and you're trying to figure out, okay, you, you turn the power onto the circuitry and you're trying to measure, you know, okay, you're starting with the supply voltages of your different sub-circuits and everything else, making sure that's there. And then if there's somewhere a shortcut, you, you, you'll you see that that supply voltage has collapsed or something. But now the problem is that supply voltage supplies a bunch of sub-circuits so it's now pretty difficult to find out, okay, well, which component here is causing the shortcut, uh -huh. right? So, you know, in the old ways, I, I used to disorder, okay, based on some suspicion, maybe starting with the highest powered item, disorder it, right? Take one thing off and see, is the shortcut still there? Okay, it's still there. And take the next one off, take the next one off. It takes a long time, wow. and especially when you have a very, you know, a very packed circuit, you have multi-layer circuit boards. It's very complex. It takes a long time. It's a very tedious process. Whereas if you're taking now a, a thermal camera to it and you're turning the circuit on, um, you know, in a passive sense, if you have a fairly severe shortcut, you can actually see something warming up. And it's typically warming up where the shortcut is. So you, you can kind of localize more what component um, or what chip or something is causing the shortcut. So that helps you speed up the process of finding out where where is that shortcut. But um, an, an even better method is is actually using active um, thermography, using a lock-in thermography system, which helps you further um, localize and really pinpoint where where that um, you know down to the trace and down to the pin of the circuit where where that shortcut um, is occurring. Yeah, let's for those who 
Well, if you're hearing this term lock-in for the first time, I think it was two episodes ago. Uh, so that would have been episode four. Uh, we Three, did four. on uh, a special. We did something very specific on non-destructive testing, um, mm -hmm. and we talk about this lock lock-in technology. So, for those of you, if if you're hearing this this term for the first time and you want to learn more about lock-in, go back and and you can listen to that. And then also, you can even go to the Movitherm website. We have some great clips and white papers there about it as well. But Mark is specific to electronics and failure analysis, how how does lock-in work? I think last time we talked about more lock-in kind of in a general sense, but maybe we can distill it down and talk about specifically how this lock-in active thermography uh, works for a failure analysis in electronics. Yeah, so the difference between using just a passive uh, approach, just you know, looking at your circuitry and with a camera, um, it, the, the, the issue there, the challenge becomes that um, when when you turn the circuitry on, let's say you have a fairly minor shortcut that may just create um, a few milliwatts of a heat dissipation, it's very difficult to see with a thermal camera because it's just a slight increase of heat. So you may miss it or, you know, because everything else gets naturally warmed by just operating conditions. So it's it's a little tough to see certain things with just a passive thermography approach, when um, or you have a complete dead short and it's just because of the dead short there's not much happening there. There's just a you know a lot of um, there's a lot of current flowing but there's no voltage. So if you take the Ohm's law, you know the power dissipation power equals the voltage times current. So if you have a dead short, you have a lot of current but almost no power. So therefore the power dissipated is very low. Um, so to counter that effect, you can use an active thermography approach, which is this lock-in approach. And what we do there is we actually, um, in the simplest form, we, we take um, uh, a programmable power supply and we pulse the, the VCC line, which is the power supply line to that circuit. And we may give it a, you know, a one hertz sort of a pulsing at the, let's say if the circuit runs at five volts or something, we give it that. And then the system starts synchronizing the, the camera's frame rate um, to that um, frequency of excitation that we're using. And it's only looking for temperature changes that match that frequency of excitation. Hmm. So um, that has the advantage that we can now pinpoint exactly where does, um, does that shortcut come from and because it's also super, super, super sensitive so that even if you have um, micro watt sort of a power dissipation, we can pinpoint where that comes from. Um, and typically a shortcut also creates a bit of a phase shift in the result image. We're getting essentially an amplitude image back and a phase image back. It's kind of when you when you talk about math, it's kind of like the real and the imaginary portion of your um, of your um, of your formula there. Um, and um, so the, the phase shift is going to be different for a properly responding circuit versus something that's shortcutted. And so you can kind of tell, is, is this normal or is this not normal based on, on, on the phase shift there? And, and that helps you to really pinpoint, um, you know, where that origin is of, of that problem, you know. And um, whereas in comparison to the passive thermography, um, you have metal in the circuit board. So if you have a heat source somewhere, it just starts bleeding so rapidly into uh -huh. the uh, traces of the circuit board, into the heat sinks, into whatever else may be going on, that you just see a large blur. So it, you have a hard time identifying it and locating its origin, where lock-in really helps you, it literally you can pinpoint it um, to exactly and you know the chip or the component or the trace or wherever that's that's happening and, and and it gives you an almost instant sort of a feedback where you need to focus your your efforts on you know, repairing the circuit troubleshooting it analyzing it whatever the case may be there i i've seen some of that imagery that you're talking about where you're comparing like a passive infrared image of an electronic compared to one uh, imaged using the lock-in technique, and and it's 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 amazing 
the difference and the detail just just based upon what you described there and perhaps in, in our podcast we maybe we could even insert some of those images before uh, this gets uh, launched and released so uh, if you're listening in and you want to see some of that imagery you can actually go and see this podcast on YouTube and we'll we'll insert some of that imagery so you can see for yourself the difference and and Marcus utilizing the technology isn't it like increasing the, the the sensitivity of your camera like a hundred times yeah theoretically it's it's a, a factor of hundred to even a thousand times you know so we have we have done long-term lock-in measurements um, we we have gotten to down to a heat dissipation of in in the nanowatt area wow that's you know? amazing yeah maybe so this that's is a... how sensitive that is you know yeah i i um I, I was thinking I wanted to ask you some questions for like the person, let's say, who is just exploring this or considering utilizing uh, infrared uh, thermography for uh, doing this kind of work, uh, electronics inspection. And uh, for them, you know, what what are the key, uh, let's say, camera specifications or what are some of the key things that they should consider even maybe beyond just the camera? What are some of those things that they should consider and, and look out for uh, if they're going to be investing in this technology uh, for doing this type of inspection? And we, we, we just talked a little bit about sensitivity and uh, maybe you can just kind of explain what that is some, and how it's hmm. expressed at different times and, and maybe what is a good um, uh, specification that they should consider if they're looking at doing this kind of work. Yeah, and the the span or the spectrum of offerings is, is very vast, right? So <laughs> yes. for, the folks, <laughs> for the folks that um, have a very, very small budget, I'm, I'm talking about like a thousand, two thousand bucks sort of a situation, I mean, there's cameras out there in that space, from from handheld cameras to to very low cost sort of cameras, um, you know. But but you get what you pay for. So those cameras, from a sensitivity perspective, um, the sensitivity is typically expressed as as a value called NETD. So if you if you pull up a spec sheet from a thermal camera, you typically see the value NETD or the name mentioned the abbreviation that that stands for 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 um, the noise equivalent temperature difference. And what that basically says is um, the, the, the camera's detector ability to resolve a temperature difference before it uh, goes into the noise floor, okay? So um, to translate this and what does it mean for me as an electronic sky troubleshooting my circuitry? So uh, as a rough estimate, you will basically be able to see something on the tens of or hundreds of milliwatts sort of a power dissipation just passively looking at a circuitry you know and that gives you some information it could be useful but it's also somewhat limiting because you can't really look at small tiny little things happening okay. um so you know you can do what's useful as you can do maybe a comparison measurement you have let's say the same circuit, one is, is healthy and working, the other one is not working. So you could point the camera at it and compare the two images and see what sort of a differences do I see here? And and might that be a clue to what's going on? You know, is there, because sometimes you don't have a shortcut, you have basically just a, a circuit not working because it just died and it doesn't create a shortcut. So maybe that circuit now stays a bit colder or it tells you, oh, because it's colder, maybe the power supply to to that circuit has died and it's not being supplied with any power therefore it's not operating therefore it's not creating any heat so there's some usefulness in in using that sort of an approach there it's it's not completely useless it's it definitely has its applications mm. there right um another thing to consider is what we call the spatial resolution that is essentially saying how many pixels do I have available in these cameras? And they are by no means, everybody is spoiled with, um, you know, your cell phone camera having 16 megabytes and 50 megabytes and 100 megabytes. I mean, not megabytes, megapixel, I'm sorry. Sort of resolution these days. Thermal cameras are not that, uh, uh, you know, high resolution. They, they're coming in, you know, uh, 
hundreds times a hundred pixels, you know, like it could be 320 by 240 or 640 by 480, something along those lines is kind of the spatial resolution that you can expect from a thermal camera. So you're not talking typically megapixels, although those are available. Those are very, you know, high end cameras, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and they may cost around, you know, upwards of a hundred thousand dollars, you know, so that's obviously a huge jump versus the one or two thousand dollar camera here. Um, and we can go into more details why that is. But so spatial resolution is really important. Um, if you're looking at a circuitry, let's say you have a circuit board three by four inches um, in diameter in, in size. Um, if, if that um, camera image that you're projecting onto that circuit board is about that size, you can now um, divide, let's say, those four inches over the 640 pixels or the 320 pixels, and you kind of get an idea for, you know, what is the per pixel size that's being projected onto my circuit board. And each pixel is essentially the equivalence um, of a thermocouple measurement, if you will, right? So, but let's say you have a small little uh, diode or something you want to measure, and it's a tiny little SMD surface mount package. You, you you want to have more than one pixel across that, otherwise you can't really measure the temperature. Let's say let's say you have a pretty poor resolution sort of a camera, and that one pixel covers maybe maybe 50% of that pixel is covered by one component, and and the other 50% is seeing the circuit board. What the camera reports back to you is really an average of the the heat signature of that one component and the temperature of the circuit board. That doesn't help you much because now you're getting um, a 50 50 sort of a thing and, and the actual apparent temperature is way lower than it actually is right so you're having a, a misleading result and, um, and you're misinterpreting what's really going on whereas if you have a sufficient high pixel resolution on your circuit board you may have you know three by three pixels over that component well now you can really mm measure what the actual temperature is um, you know on that component and you get an, a, a much better picture spatially speaking it's not that pixelated if you're looking at the image but also the actual temperature readout is way more accurate of, of what's really going on and way more telling so it's it's really important to understand um, a the the NETD the sensitivity capability of the camera and what that does but also the the spatial resolution to make sure that I have enough spatial um, you know, resolving capability of, of what I'm looking at, you know, those, yeah. those two parameters are very important. Excellent points, Marcus. Yeah, I guess it, I guess it wouldn't matter how sensitive your camera is if, if you don't have enough pixels on target or, or vice right. versa, right? So two, two exactly. excellent, uh, uh, or, or important parameters to consider. We, we, we hear a lot too about accuracy. Uh, on 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 cameras, and I know sometimes that can get a little confusing for folks, and and it can be reported in several different ways. You'll see things like plus or minus one percent, or plus or minus two uh, degrees of reading, uh, it, it, and I guess bottom line, you know, for again, someone who's looking at this technology for this application, uh, what kind of role? does accuracy play in that and and what should they be looking out for right so that in a sense depends again on what you're trying to to quantify on or do you try to quantify because you can do a qualitative analysis just looking at is there something getting warmer than expected or if you're doing the comparison measurement to one circuit board that you know is good versus the other you may get away with just a uh, a qualitative look at it and say, oh, this one gets warmer than the other, where it's not that important, you know, what the absolute temperature is. You just notice a different behavior in thermal heat dissipation, generally speaking. And and again, that in and of itself could be useful. Um, whereas if you are, let's say, the design engineer and you, you're trying to plug in some values, you know, quantitatively um, into your 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 design and making sure that you really are just dissipating X amount of milliwatts or watts or whatever the case may be, then you may be more interested in the absolute accuracy of the measurement, right? So the accuracy um, doing thermography is quite complex. So there's the actually um, intrinsic accuracy of the camera. And like you said, it you may have a camera model, again, looking at the spec sheet that says um, plus minus two degrees Celsius, 
um, or plus minus two degrees, um, plus minus two percent of reading, or what we call full scale, whichever is mm. greater. And that's quite the complex statement to digest if you look at it at first, right? So when you say of reading um, um, or of full scale, it, typically you have a temperature range that the camera is calibrated to. So it could be like a zero to 350 degrees Celsius or something. That's your full scale. And then the percentage is then basically based on that full scale, um, yeah. you know, or it's based on, on the instantaneous reading that you have. And, and a lot of people are saying like, well, why can I not measure something more accurately than, than, than plus minus two degrees or some, some cameras are plus minus five, you know, really, really, really good one on laboratory conditions may achieve plus minus one degree. Um, you know, and then you can also um, um, add, let's say a calibrated uh, reference um, black body to it. And you may be able to push the camera to half a degree or a quarter of a degree. You know, but what you also have to consider, especially in microelectronics, is um, a phenomenon uh, in physics, uh, especially in conjunction with thermography, is called emissivity. Hmm. So emissivity is is the ability of any sort of solid object to radiate infrared um, radiation or heat, um, and that is exactly uh, the phenomenon that that the camera is capturing and measuring, right? So. And it, there are some very complex, complex formulas behind it, and they are not not linear and, and everything. So it's it's kind of hard to understand the whole thing. The the one thing to take away though is if I'm looking at a circuit board, I have a very very complex scenery. I have um, packages, um, electronic packages of these devices that are you know there's plastic around them, there's black plastic around them, maybe there may be white plastic around them. There's um, the 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 legs or, or the, you know the the connection points to these uh, devices are typically shiny metal, right? Hmm. Uh, there are solder masks on there. There's there's screen print on there. There's there's other pieces of metal for heat sinks. So the the everything I'm looking at will have a dis a different emissivity on it. So if I'm looking at it and I'm having multiple spots that I'm measuring, um. I need to be aware and, 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 and I need to have a good understanding of what that means now. Because even if my camera gives me plus minus two degrees, I cannot just expect pointing a camera at a circuit board and believe everything that the camera is reporting back and say, oh, I'm going to be at least within that plus minus two degrees. Because if I mismatch the emissivity setting in the camera, I could be 10, 15, 20 or more degrees off with my measurement and again, draw a completely wrong conclusion. Mm. Um, you know, and that's true for any sort of um, thing. I've, I've been talking to um, a customer with a complex system that it's like a, a battery pack for an electrical vehicle. Same thing again, there's metal tabs on it. There's electronic components on it. There's this, there's that. Just pointing a camera on it and reading a bunch of different things, the temperatures are all over the place, you know? So that, that could lead to a lot of uh, frustration and misinterpretation. So the, the, the way to um, counter this is a camera typically has a setting, which is an emissivity setting that you have to select to match the emissivity value of the surface that, you, that you're measuring. The problem with that is if you have a complex scene like a circuit board that has 50 different emissivity values, what are you going to do with that? So you can take a smart camera and you have maybe four or five different regions that you can create and maybe you can set the emissivity per each region and therefore correct for that. But there's another element to this like, okay, how do I even know what the emissivity, <laughs> what, what is the correct emissivity of my electronic component? Yeah. Like, so, so the, the whole subject matter of, of emissivity correction is quite complex it is solvable um we have for instance uh, on our electronic side of software we can actually do a emissivity pixel map correction so we can actually create a different emissivity correction per pixel of the camera okay and the way you do this is you actually um have the the um the object that you're trying to measure equalize at a certain temperature. So typically, I mean, you could have it lying there at, at room temperature and just wait till everything is at room temperature, but a smarter way of doing this is actually putting it on a heat plate 
and um, increasing um, the heat at least 10, 12, 15, maybe 20 degrees over ambient and let it settle or put it in a thermal chamber. Then take a picture of the entire circuit board knowing that every component that's on there is right now at the exact same temperature. Mm. And the camera on a pixel by pixel basis will measure a bunch of different temperatures because of the differences in, in emissivities. And, but you know it's all at the same temperature. So now you can perform that pixel correction for the emissivity. And from then on forward, now, as long as you don't move the circuit board anymore by any pixel, yeah, it has to be properly fixtured. Now you can start measuring with the right pixel map um, and emissivity map per pixel and, and, and actually create the correct measurements. So th there's a lot of kind of, you know, know-how that you have to acquire if you wanted to do precise, accurate measurements, you know. Yeah, no, excellent points. And, and you're, you're <laughs> the, a, a conversation around emissivity, that could be a, a whole nother, you know, six episodes of the thermal review, right? I mean, there are training right. courses uh, available out there uh, to help you understand as a thermographer, someone using a camera to do thermography, how to extract the most accurate information out of that device. I, I had uh, a, 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 an instructor, an infrared training instructor years ago. Uh, he did a great job drilling it into my head that infrared cameras do not measure temperature. They right. calculate a temperature. In fact, they calculate an, a, an apparent temperature. There are parameters or variables either on the camera or within software that allow you to make the adjustments for those calculations to try to equate the apparent temperature to the actual temperature. So uh, just uh, so like you just described so perfectly this uh, phenomena of emissivity and understanding that um, how important that can be, especially for <laughs> that very dynamic scene that you have from an emissivity perspective dynamic, meaning everything emits, reflects, and and does its own thing a little differently. Um, however, yeah. there yeah. is a way to combat yeah. it, right? Through that, that right. correction process. Yeah. Yeah. When, you know, our listeners that are listening into this thing, I, I, I need to really, I want to caution people because way too often do I deal with folks that are like, oh, they just treat it as, oh, here's my thermometer. I stick it into my mouth and, and it's telling me my temperature and I, I have, you know, that's it. It is not that easy, you know, and, yeah. and there's a reason why the, the, the thermography beginners class is 40 hours long just to teach you the basics you know, and you're like, well, how can that be? Because I'm pointing the camera and it's telling me in digital readout, that's the temperature. Like, what do I need 40 hours of training for here? When, and that's the disconnect, that it, it is so complex. The physics behind what you're doing is so complex that you're just scratching the surface after 40 hours of training. And that yeah. should not be underestimated. You know what I mean? Like, um, that that's what I'm saying. Like, that it's really, it's really out there. I mean, it goes from understanding physics the, the 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 surface composition of your materials you have the you have reflection issues you have transmission and certain materials where the camera starts seeing through materials you know emissivity changes with temperature emissivity changes with angle of incidence you know i mean there's so many things and um, it, it is really tough to to measure accurately temperature with a thermal camera if you don't know what you're doing you know? exactly yeah but that's the ultimate goal is to try to equate that apparent temperature that's calculated by the camera to reality. And it can be done, you, but you need to know right. how to do it. Um, right. Yeah. Marcus, thank you. Thank you for, for your time today. Thank you for this discussion around electricity uh, and thermography, passive, active thermography, things to look out for as someone who has utilized this technology and done electronics design. I mean, we have that happening right now at MovieTherm. We've, we've produced 
uh, solutions that have electronics built into them. So this is something we're right. doing firsthand uh, here. Um, yeah. So thank you for this discussion. It's 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 it it, it can uh, be a deeper discussion. Uh, and if if you're evaluating, if you're listening in or watching, and 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 you want to learn more, we encourage that. And there's multiple places where you can go to get that information to be educated, and we're here to here to help as well in that process. So we uh, are available to you if you have a a problem that you're trying to solve with thermography. That's that's why we exist as as an organization, Movitherm. Please. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, but this does wrap up today's episode of the Thermal Review. And uh, thank you for listening to us as we talked about some of these megatrends that are that are impacting just the developments and miniaturization of electronics even further and heat management, but also how you can utilize this amazing, amazing technology of thermography uh, uh, to aid in the development and manufacture and optimization of electronics. Uh, I do want to make a, a brief announcement that our next episode is going to be kind of a unique one. Marcus is headed off to Stuttgart, Germany next week to attend the Vision Show. The week after that, I'm attending the Vision Show here uh, in the New England area in Boston, Massachusetts. And our next episode of the podcast, we're going to be talking about some of the things that we're seeing as new developments, new trends, technologies, applications uh, in the vision space. So you won't want to miss that. Please, please join us uh, in that next episode. And, and who knows, if you happen to be at the Vision Show and see either Marcus or myself walking around with a little movie therm uh, uh, on our on our chest, please uh, stop us. We'd love to meet you. Um, as we always mention, we're here to help educate. That's uh, one of the things that we feel strongly about. The technology of infrared is amazing. Uh, and education can help it be amazing and exact. Uh, so we're here at your disposal to help with that. I thank you for your time today. Marcus, any parting comments to our audience? Yeah, I can only second that. It's, um, you know, I encourage our, our um, folks out there that have an interest um, or have some ideas what they want to learn about. Again, leave comments in on our YouTube channel, um, you know, on, on this episode or any other episodes, um, you know, drop us an email, go to our website, fill out the contact us form. Uh, you know what we we really uh we as you can see we are very enthusiastic and, and passionate about what we're doing here we have been doing it well, i've been doing it for 23 years now and uh i'm i'm still learning every day and you know solving these these problems that are out there and and uh you know make use of our experience uh and expertise um and let us help you with your um challenges and we can we can pretty quickly understand your application that you're up against um, that's what we're very, uh, very good at that. Um, and, uh, you know, together we can we can help you solve, you know, your inspection needs out there for, for sure, you know. Absolutely. Marcus, you don't look a day over 25. <laughs> <laughs> he started thermography when he was two. Anyways, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to, to meeting with you again in the next uh, episode of the Thermal Review. Yep, sounds great. See you guys next time.